Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Star Night Dwell podcast. We're here with Janine Molina of Black Earth Botanica. You might have come across as the uh, the ultimate um, cross section of plants, goth, planets, astrology, magic um, on Instagram or through ritual craft or through the various avenues that Janine has been um, selling her wares. And I'm really excited to talk to another creative person. I've been trying to do more episodes um, with people who make things and who can speak to, you know, embodied physical experiences of, of working with, you know, talismanic, magical sorts of, of, of creations. So I'm really excited for this as well as um, I am someone who owns some of Janine's creations and um, I just love the whole vibe of of Black Earth Botanica. One of the things we were talking about before we hit record is on the the shop front page. It's an image of Janine holding a um, uh, the the algal flower, the hellebore, the black hellebore, which uh, excited me and sparked some good conversation. But before I get too ahead of myself in that respect, um, I will let Janine introduce herself and um, just want to thank you for being on. How are you doing? Of course. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm doing great. I'm glad we're finally able to make this happen because as you know, everyone knows sometimes when you have two creative people that get together, try to set a date for something, it's almost impossible. So this has been months in the making and glad we finally are able to do it today. Oh, yeah. Um, Right before uh, Neptune goes retrograde and Saturn just went retrograde. So I feel like that's not a coincidence uh, that has some significance in my own life with uh, being a Pisces eight house moon. That's definitely a big part of my my uh practice uh or at least how i'm looking at it my eighth house moon kind of guides a lot of that um but yeah so that's i feel like astrologically it's no no real coincidence that it's happening right now uh it's totally. the right time in the stars <laughs> we love we love our eighth house moons here on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> as well as our 12th house moons um yes and uh third house we moons stand as with well. you yes. <laughs> yes we stand together um, but yeah, definitely the Saturn retrograde is, is bringing me back to a lot of, um, a lot of these sorts of things. And, um, besides the more mundane, like re-examining, um, I guess the more, yeah, mundane Saturnine things of like finan financial and organizational type life stuff. Um, but yeah, like magical people who have been really wanting to get on the podcast, but it hasn't necessarily worked out with timing, as you said, because that's magic people are a little hard to pin down sometimes, but that's okay. Saturn will pin it down. And you know, yeah, Saturn right? is having, <laughs> um, I kind of, I mean, I don't like a retrograde who likes one, but I do kind of like the effect that retrogrades will have, um, in a in a broader sense where like let's say saturn is not uh fully acting the way it, most befitting of how one would want saturn to show up in their life uh if you're like trying to uh have boundaries or trying to put in the work right um and for whatever reason like saturn an immutable sign like right now it's like not working to your to your benefit but then when the retrograde happens, you can see why and make an effort to kind of help it out and apply it where you you would most like it, where it's going to be most helpful. 
so that I feel like that's sort of what's happening now because it's right on my moon. It's the same degree. I just went through my Saturn Oof. natal moon conjunct and I thought I was like, oh, great. You know, it'll be fine. We're going to move past that a little bit. And like it said, no, we're we're backing up. We just ran over you and now we're backing up over you. And then, you know, back in maybe February, I think it it's coming back in February rather. So, Oof. yeah, that'll be that'll be real great. Oh, feels real heart, good my heart goes out to you i have i have some um some of the closest and best people in my life are going through their sadi satis right now as well oh. um yeah <laughs> we all find just... each other yeah at the same time we're all like let's help each other yeah um well i'm i'm glad you're you're om- you're almost through it um and i i know it'll be better on the other side um well, but my heart goes out to you Thank you. I, um, to my understanding, because I, I'm one of those people that doesn't follow Vedic astrology as closely as I should. And that's admittedly, but I know that that transit does last for at least five years, right? It's like when it's in the house before and then the house exactly. after, because exactly. I've, I've heard this from people that I'm like, Oh, you're, you're over it. And they're like, no, I have another two yeah. years. I'm like, I can't envision this lasting any longer except you know i'm already pretty goth as you pointed out so (laughs) (laughs) i i (laughs) I personally i would i wouldn't even for someone who's not familiar with it i wouldn't even bring up the like the sign after the moon sign i would just see that as a kind of integration period of sorts but i think really really the the hardest part is going to be leading up to it especially when it's in the sign which you know you're and unfortunately, or fortunately, I would hope more fortunately in the midst of, um, but yeah, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't tell them like, oh, well, there's two and a half years after <laughs> as well. That seems a little bit cruel. Yeah, it was, I mean, you know, not to get too personal, but the lead up was almost unbearable. Um, and a few people did point out like, yes, this is coinciding with becoming middle-aged. So that's another hard uh reality is a face when uh you really have to come face to face with like now you're your own daddy basically um not that that ever was like that big of a deal before uh i don't have peter pan syndrome i swear but (laughs) it's difficult it's it's different and difficult for everybody in a different way to you know move into your 40s gracefully and sometimes you want to go kicking and screaming even though that's not your vibe (laughs) <laughs> sometimes yeah. you're like ah, i can't do it so um yeah it's a, it's a nice little uh coincide there which it's you know just gotta i don't know you gotta pay the time lord you gotta pay the toll always. for yeah always. yeah there's been, <laughs> having there's a been capricorn a... father <laughs> sorry uh, i was just gonna say there's been a couple people on the show who have been right at that point of saturn transiting their moon um, and I mean, we didn't we didn't say it explicitly, but um, I like to think that maybe this is the podcast for those who like are are taking it to that level of things. Yeah, you should you should change the name of it or like do like a once in a while special where like this is the uh, Saturn Moon conjunction podcast uh, for Patreon subscribers only. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I'll get I'll get all y'all together. Um even just in one episode and we can all chat about it. That would be, yeah. Yeah. That'd be more like group therapy. I'm here for it. (laughs) Astrological group therapy. Which Um, I mean, can be helpful for those listening as well. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. If you could introduce yourself, your work and, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole deep dive. I hope that can be the conversation, but how how black earth came about how it how it arose out of the black earth um and even just astrology and magic and how that tied in with your work with plants um just an introduction for those who are unfamiliar with your work um so i have to try to keep myself very straight and narrow when i'm um describing this because i will go off on a side quest so you have to stop me (laughs) but it does go back pretty deep um and it was something i never realized before obviously we all have connections to plants and flowers to some degree um but when i really thought about answering that question this come up a few times in life you know um 
I remembered being a kid and having my first, I guess, what would be called like a like a plant spirit introduction dream where a, dr- a plant will introduce themselves to you, usually in a dream. Uh, sometimes they just keep showing up and you're like, wow, this plant is just in my life constantly. I see it everywhere. That's usually what it, that happens over and over when you work with them. It just is they really, really will hit you over the head. And even some of the most like science uh oriented herbalists still will kind of keep that respect for the absolute magic and power of the way that they communicate with us so uh that being said when i was pretty young i don't remember what age but you know i would have these dreams all the time some of them were incredibly lucid some of them were just stress dreams you know most of them were like a little prophetic and in this one because i grew up in jersey city i you know, have access to nature. Nature is all around. I don't put it in those terms. We had a backyard too, you know, everything there's, there's greenery everywhere and we are a part of nature, but I did not really grow up uh, around a bounty of different plants that would want to communicate with me if they had the chance, let's put it that way. Uh, And that's probably similar for a lot of city kids. So I had a dream about an echinacea tea bag that was talking to me in a drawer and that was my plant spirit dream and it took (laughs) me so i know it took me so many years to realize that that's what that was because i was like what the hell um and it wasn't until i started going through my own saturn's return actually and working with them more seriously having like an influx like a, a giant influx uh also having neptune on my moon i think at that time um so many dreams so many plans so much to interpret uh you know and it's really what got me through my saturn's return and kind of taking their their lead so it was then a lot of purple flowers started coming up and it was you know all different types of purple flowers in my dreams um sometimes as like a waking vision they would be different guides even like little lamiaceae like peppermint flowers or you know something that would be purple and um then I realized, oh shit, that's also echinacea. Echinacea is technically purple, isn't it? It's just, it was the first of many purple flower dreams. So um, yeah, that being said, that was kind of really where it started. And then the Saturn's return, I became more serious with herbalism. Um, my family, at least on on one side that I grew up with, is Sicilian and uh, like Italian-American melange. I say this because there are so many cultures under that umbrella that uh, it's hard to really quantify exactly where some of these things came from. Some of this, this what we look at as like a everyday magic or religious or folklore, and it's, you know, technically witchcraft. So uh, that's sort of what I grew up with. And at least like in the, the household and the neighborhood I grew up in on my mother's side. Um, so I kind of learned how to uh, sympathetically work with materials at a young age because I was always in my head and I was always daydreaming, but I didn't realize that's the perfect reception for allowing spirits to come through you, um, allowing plants to talk to you, allowing like just leaving yourself open basically. So I would make charms and, uh, you know, little gree gree bags, which I wasn't even really sure what they were at some point during my childhood and then my adolescence. I became more serious about it, but I wasn't really able to handle it, I think. Like, it wasn't the right time. Um, I didn't really have that power of Saturn behind me. I'm an Aries, so I, I had a lot of Mars. And my household was very martial. I grew up with two other Aries around. So, um, yeah, I really did not have that sort of guiding planet uh show up in my life just yet but uh with saturn's return brought a lot of uh i guess strictness that i needed and a lot of focus so that kind of helped me i didn't set out to even uh start a business i still don't even like to think of my business as a business but i have to look at it like that um but yeah i started making materials particularly fragrant materials and different um, tinctures and stuff because I was so overwhelmed with all of this information and I I almost wanted to categorize everything like a little library and and work with each and every plant. I know that that's not always possible. It takes a lifetime, right? 
Uh, but I had so much information coming in. I was so excited, really. And it was the perfect time period to like pick up and start studying and then start making my own materia. Uh, and yeah, back to that, I would buy things from spiritual supply stores and some botanicas and I would get home and realize, oh, this isn't really what I thought it was. So I had to start learning about essential oils, um, how to distill fragrance from, you know, plants using tinctures and stuff and other methods because I wasn't finding exactly what it was that that I wanted for my practice. You know, something would come to me and I'm like, all right, I really need to find this. And um, it just wasn't available. So I was making things for myself and for my friends. And of course, it starts off like, oh, let's make some planetary oils. And then the more you get into it, the more you realize how aligned with scent and taste and sight, uh, obviously, in some cases, but like all of our senses, um, each planet and each sign is even down to the fixed stars, which is not the the highlight of my focus in my work right now. Um, but I do sort of use that for at least like a reference when I'm, or at least I use the planets that they are most related to usually uh, when I'm I'm beginning to work with one. So I want to approach them with uh, any plants from folklore that they're already connected to, um, the energies of the planets that they're most aligned with. And then, you know, you kind of see what ends up working. Did your uh, petitions work as well as you thought? What could you do differently next time? Um, and then, you know, during which elections are they going to be most powerful with what else is going on in the in the heavens? So that being said, yeah, that's a little bit of how I got started. And where it's going and you know where i'm at now so i mean it sounds like plants have very much been there since the very beginning how how do you feel about astrology and the celestial spheres and all this stuff coming into your your practice that also something you feel like was was very very um a primary from a young age or um it sort um, of with your saturn return it began coming in more you know, it, it wasn't ever really something I focused on. I mean, I like everybody kind of was into sun signs a little bit and that's it. Like my, my household, uh, although it was, it was a bunch of elderly women mostly <laughs> that I lived with, but we would always check our horoscopes in the newspaper, like most people. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't frowned upon. It wasn't thought of as something that was like fake. Uh, I think somebody had a Linda Goodman book at some point. I could be wrong, but yeah, that's just basically the, you know, my only background in it until I started talking to, you know, other quote unquote occultists at the time who encouraged me to look more into, um, you know, my own birth chart at that time because I had not been as focused on astrology. Uh, and I actually think that that's probably a good thing because I don't really know what I would have made of it before I think I would have seen things a little differently I also should note that it was around my Saturn's return maybe it was my 28th birthday might have been a little after or I, I can't even think of the year but I ate mushrooms for the first time so that was a big uh boon for my my astrological and plant and fragrance and occult and everything like a uh what's the word I'm looking for? Just my way of seeing, basically, because then all of a sudden it makes more sense. You know, I didn't like hallucinogens. Uh, it wasn't really my thing. I never experimented. And I feel like a lot of people would go, wow, that's a little late in life to have had your first mushroom experience. But uh, whatever it was, you know, it worked. It was at the right time. And it was up until that point, too. Like, I, I started doing all of these... Uh, these charts for these events that I remember of like this birthday, that birthday, blah, blah, blah. And like really the astrology was so spot on every time, um, especially little random coincidences and such that I, at that point there was, there was no excuses anymore to sort of just uh, like most people kind of that I would, I would ask them for help. I'd be like, Oh, I can't really, can't really read this that well it's always great when some of your best friends are astrologers too <laughs> so i'd be like explain this to me what's that um and now i'm the person that has to explain things to people it's like paying my my dues back but um yeah so after that point that was basically like after you see 
how much um, sort of alignment and coincidence is there. That's like synchronicity is really. Uh, so nothing is purely coincidental. Uh, the universe is slapping you in the face and just telling you to pay attention or you're going to keep going through the same trials and tribulations till you figure it out. So, so yeah, yet again, I felt my hands were tied. I had to, <laughs> I had to study and I had to, you know, be a little bit more withdrawn and less social and more studious. So sometimes it's the pop stuff that ends up just being a catalyst for so much. I, I don't know why I'm remembering this, this story in particular, but my cousin, he was really into this popular astrology book called the birthday book. Have you, oh have yeah, you seen I think that I remember one? that. Yeah. Which I'm, I'm not even sure I should really call it an astrology book because it's just like based, I think mostly on tarot correspondences um, and, and numerology, but um, he, he kept, telling me like all these weird synchronicities he was getting with the birthday book and he was like was like oh well my my birthday it's the 15th and um so that makes me the devil card and then he was like and then after i saw that i realized that my name um my name adds up to 666 together and he started going through all these crazy synchronicities and i was like oh wow okay this is uh, for the for the birthday book, that's a pretty potent and profound set of uh, intense experiences <laughs> <laughs> um, to realize that you're the devil, all from the birthday book. Anyways, um, I, I'm I'm curious about echinacea being this plant, this almost like initiating plant for you, and I'm wondering if it's something that you've returned to in your practice or, you know, uh, uh, something that you've made and, and, a, and a strong plant ally for you since that time? You know, it, it has, it absolutely has in my own life. And so like, uh, I've used it for a lot of like issues that may come up, you know, everybody has their own, um, it's what's the term I would be looking for, but like idiosyncratic issues that you can't really put your finger on in your body. You just know, like, once in a while you need to take this particular supplement or herb or something and it kind of helps even it out you know um especially as we're all just battling food allergies and all sorts of things so um just because echinacea tends to be more cooling to structure uh as my old herbalist joshua muscat had put it um it's something that has brought at least like temporary relief when i've been taking it uh, for some sort of food allergies. And, you know, obviously like this isn't going to work for everybody. I'm not recommending that. This is why I would make a terrible clinical herbalist, by the way, <laughs> is because I jump around too much when I'm trying to explain things to people and they're like, I'm sorry, what, what did you want me to do? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, don't, this is, this is speaking at least for my own body and my own situation, because it also boosts, uh, white blood cell production, which is not something that everybody, is going to find comfort with if you have autoimmune issues particularly so mm -hmm. um yeah there's all, all sorts of things like i really really encourage people to read as much as you can um scientifically on some of these plants too before using them because it's anybody can have like a negative reaction to almost anything and uh this idea that kind of gets sort of brought up in in holistic circles is like which kind of even falls into a little bit with the, the Virgo situation that like, oh, you know, if it's if you're having some uncomfortable symptoms, it means it's working. I'm like, no, not necessarily. I've seen things work for people and then not. I've seen it stop. I've seen, you know, the negative symptoms outweigh the ones they were having in the first place. So it yeah, it really, really depends. And you know, it is really interesting. I just think like researching almost anything you put in your body and then the um, congruences with them or associations, uh, those are always helpful. But one thing, and this is, this is going to be hard because I have to, you know, tell myself this constantly, uh, just because we're looking for these microcosm, macrocosm, like associations that like sympathia, uh, doesn't mean that it's always going to be the right thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to hear that this plant that's coming to you for whatever reason, it might not be the thing that is going to solve all your problems. You know, just like 
when people come to you in life and they keep ending up in your path, it might not be your soulmate. It might be someone that helps you figure something out, but for whatever reason, you know, like the reason that, that they're calling upon you might be to work with them as a flower essence, um, the plant, not the person, but you know, both, whatever, <laughs> whatever you feel comfortable with. That's a... I wish we could make people essence <laughs> and then we don't have to see them. I was just going to say that's a real that's I mean, maybe the toughest lesson, especially in these worlds for people to hear, but really only the lesson that someone who has Saturn transiting their moon currently <laughs> could could deliver, you know, in the, in the way that you just did. But I mean, yeah, I think and I, I think that goes even beyond, as you correctly pointed out, it goes beyond just, you know, plants coming into your life. But I think people do this with like deities and spirits all the time where they take a a synchronicity or, you know, even, even frankly, you know, a dream that they had, and then they take it as a full license to call themselves now a, a, a priest of the, you know, the dead tradition that is whatever in Greek mythology and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, um, I don't know, just because something crossed your path and you noticed it doesn't necessarily mean it's like, I don't, the, either the best thing for you that it's good for your health that re really much of anything um so I, and yeah i thank you for including plants and plant medicine in that as well i think that's a really really important lesson thank yeah, you saturn <laughs> yeah thank you always um it is it's it's hard to because um we tend to and I've, i noticed this from when i first started working with magic when i was i mean like what, what i would say is like any sort of traditional magic or like dabbling in it like most adolescents do um and then you start to try to use that way of thinking and find congruences rather than them finding you etc because you're trying to make sense of everything you've seen in the world up until that point and you know in a way astrology is the gateway for a lot of people working with that too but then like if we haven't truly experienced some things either and we have no way to put our finger on it then like it's it's not really up to us to be the one to to be like a leader or a guide for people and um like unfortunately we're in this this place where not to get too away from the subject content but this line of thinking that a lot of us will will use when we are um trying to think mythologically or make connections to us so that way it will deepen our relationship with these plants or planets or etc and look for every you know bit of information we can on them or any any uh personal gnosis or any unsubstantiated uh what's the term that we're actually using now i think it used to be like unsubstantiated personal gnosis and now it might be oh, um, um like you I up it was still upg yeah yeah so um <laughs> and all that is is it like totally fine um but we also can't conflate all of these things with like the absolute reality of the situation because this is also how we have like and, and maybe some people feel insulted by this but like the flat earth line of thinking where it starts off one way and then all of a sudden people think they're unearthing this whole big conspiracy and it's really like they're they're looking to um uh and now I can't think of the term because I keep wanting to think cognitive dissonance, but it's not. It's confirmation bias. There we go. Uh, so in both ways, sometimes we use our own confirmation bias rather than the reality of a situation. And, you know, we all can get carried away with that, basically, like because we get a little addicted to the highs of finding out more and more information. And like then we're we're like completely stoked when something makes a connection and we're like, ah, yes, you know, and that that's very real. I don't want to take away from from anyone who does need like magical um uh confirmation sometimes we we do need confirmation from sharing these stories with other people because they can feel really alone you know and there's a lot of people that are having these experiences um that are otherworldly and they, they feel really alone they need to make connections uh because otherwise then you know you you can get a little carried away or um you can't really have like an anchor in, in community, which can be hard too. And some people prefer to work like that. That's cool. But yeah, other times it's like, you know, people go completely off the rail, like <laughs> not even like separate train of thought, but like just completely off into the woods, off the train tracks. And, um, you know, I think we need to kind of help each other <laughs> like a little bit.
uh otherwise you know it can be it can be a little mentally unhealthy so you know i think yeah. that's also a really important point and i would say if you look at the way that these things are dealt with across the world it is in community settings of some kind i mean rarely is it um, you know, a sole individual. And like you said, some people just don't have that. And I, I mean, my heart goes out to them too. Um, and, you know, there's oftentimes good reasons that they don't have that. But yeah, I, I mean, I think it is community, which can can help to mitigate so much of those like, am I seeing this thing? Is this for real? Is, is this connection with this you know, otherworldly thing really as strong as I feel like it is? Or is this just like a passing thing? Like, is this healthy for me? Like all of that definitely functions best in a community setting and with people you trust. Uh, to, to that point, something that I had asked a previous guest, Vanessa Arena, who's a, a, a talisman maker, um, she had she and she focuses specifically on talismans of a more malefic bent and her her store sword and scythe is specifically under the auspices of mars and saturn and one of the things that i asked because i i think that it's interesting and i'd like to just go to the jugular with it is like um you know how she deals with feeling that responsibility the responsibility around sort of what we're just talking about of like knowing that this can be a challenging thing for many people but also you know whether you're offering divination or whether you're selling things as, as you are that are um that are you know, magical objects if you will um to to people who are going through these kinds of challenges i mean is that is that something that you that you you're thinking about is that something you're reckoning with is it um have you ever had email correspondences or conversations with um clients customers around that sort of thing like is this a good oil or perfume for me to buy does that make sense as a question Yes, absolutely. And so I have I have a few different ways of answering this in true Pisces moon fashion. <laughs> but um, so I I completely sympathize and would just relate to having a lot of malefic energy around. Um, and I think for some people, it's actually like, I mean, I can only speak for my own self and like how I've come to terms with that in my life, right? As I am an Aries, uh, my mother is all Mars. She is an Aries, uh, not a triple Aries. Her her rising is uh, Cancer, but she has a Mars uh, in Scorpio. And then what else is in Aries besides? Because she's a new moon baby, so she's Aries, Aries, and then I think her Mercury is in Aries. So that's that's like my. <laughs> I was lucky enough to have this sort of Aries mirror of like who is the most martial person you could think of and then meeting some other very scorpionic people and seeing how that differs of course as the diurnal and nocturnal thrones so um it, it is always good to have other people's energy around to see like how it can be I grew up in a, like a house with a lot of Capricorns in it too like big family of older Capricorns and my dad so that's basically like my uh, Sasha Ravitch, who we both know and love very much. Hi, Sasha. Uh, called it the Malefic Bunch, <laughs> like Hi, the Sasha, Brady Bunch. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's actually very on point. Um, so, yeah, like having that type of energy, I think like, um, you know, we we will deal with it in a different way than someone else. And obviously for some people, it is completely painful. And I, I can't imagine like what they're going through, especially when... Um, you know, we look at charts that have like, uh, like some for some people to have like, a, let's say like a, a Neptune Mars conjunction or something else or like Mars in a painful house, like something like that. Uh, I think it can be a lot harder to deal with some of those things depending on who you are, especially like in society, you know, because we're going to internalize something, especially like Mars on your moon. Like I dated someone <laughs> with a uh, Marshall moon conjunction in Aries and they never let on to like, like we had only dated three months, but I was like waiting to see how this comes out or what it really represents in their life. And, uh, I never could figure it out. And then I, I was just like, you know what, that's probably, it's, it's not for me to figure out it's for them. And everybody carries it differently. And some people are really comfortable with it and other people, um, just are not, you know, uh, but so that being said, 
sometimes when people are going through a really hard time uh, and they do want, like I offer these custom chart oils. So it will take your natal chart and just from having studied all of these plants for you know a good long while, it takes a lot of their different facets into play, not just their scent. So you're wearing it as some sort of like connection to your own chart, right? Uh, but usually if somebody has a concern ahead of time, because this is one of the only times I really have like a more in-depth conversation with like a, a customer, or I would even say a client, because this is definitely a service. Um, you know, I want to make sure that let's say if they do have a lot of malefic energy in their chart, uh, they're not getting the wrong plants for them in that moment. Like they're still going to have Mars. There's going to be a plant that represents that. Uh, if they're really concerned about that, I'm going to switch it out a little bit to something that's more gentle. Um, usually all of these things flow in some way with the other ingredients in the, uh, in the perfume. It can get a little crazy where all of a sudden I'm like, well, I'm going to take every conjunction and even the decans into play and see what we need to put more of. in. And, you know, it's, it's evolved a little bit over the years because I've, I found what, what works and what people like more than anything. But um, yeah, sometimes it's like, I would recommend, you know, to embrace plants, certain plants, at least if we're working with them, like fragrantly um, in a perfume, not just like as aromatherapy, um, or as another type that might be like a little bit more of a, a hard on application, I would say like working with them can be a form of amelioration. So like, I'm not going to use um, the R word. <laughs> uh, I can't say anything as for mediation oh. because that's a little <laughs> bit. <yeah. laughs> the R I think, word. I think you're the first who explicitly <clears throat> will not use the R word that I've heard. Everyone else uses the R word. I just, you know, like I'm not a Twitter person and I want to build community, but I'm not ready to get into some sort of like oh. hole of contention where they're like, she called this remediation and it wasn't by the book. Like, OK, that's fine. I like to use the word, word amelioration because it's not like it's exactly fixing everything and it's not even necessarily using magic. Like, I don't like to apply things with the hammer when you need a scalpel anyways. I feel like some of it is bypassing. And then you do have to go through certain trials because they're going to show up later. Whenever you hear of these, um, you know, really big, like horrible things that happen, sometimes I'm like, oh, wow, maybe that actually was like somebody bypassed, you know, this lesson way too much that they really needed, but it was really uncomfortable for them. It's like withdrawing from a drug, right? You have to do it. Um, the longer you kind of go without doing it uh if you want to use other methods like that's fine but uh, it's each each method that you use is going to have a different outcome in the end and sometimes you're never going to go through full withdrawal and get everything that you need out of that and you know it's it's kind of the same or similar at least with like the lessons the planets are trying to teach us so i mean you could tell i already go <laughs> i go through whatever horrible, painful thing I think I need to, even though I might have an out for it because I feel like it's cleansing in some way and it needs to happen. I'm like, at least I got this over with. So, um, you know, if you want to take the advice of a crazy person like me, then sure. Uh, I will just oh, have that no, to say. Is that... <laughs> I, uh, amelioration I mean, I really is, I think, a much better it. word. You're right. It is a much, but I mean, I would just say it's, it's for, a gentler for... Yeah, you know, it's but... not it's not really trying to get around anything. It's using something to sometimes it is like taking on less and fully. I think um, you're just getting it from a different angle, you know, like uh, sometimes it, it really because all uh, now I'm going to sound like I'm rambling, but like, let's use the example of like Culpepper. This is sort of how I I work with plants in this realm, too. It'll be uh, a plant might be martial, but in in what sign you know, and this energy is going to look different. Uh, it's going to look different depending on what's going on with the other planets, etc. So, and of course, what decan it's in. And we have we have so many considerations about that, right? Um, so sometimes it's going to be harder to be like a, a first house Aries Sun or Mars than than for someone else that has something else that might really be happy with that. You know, so I would recommend different plants for different things, but like. Uh, sometimes it, as a flower essence it's easier it's more gentle 
sometimes that's more powerful than using it as like a in its whole plant form because you're getting just like the spirit communication there and it's it's something that's it is hard to describe but uh if you're using things aromatically i mean as an aries i've i've gotten headaches from my mars oil i've had to kind of change it up a little bit the whole uh adage about basil being a breeding a scorpion in the brain i don't know if that was cold pepper or if that was someone else now i'm like trying to think but uh yeah that's completely true <laughs> no i haven't heard that it's, basil with basil you said basil like yeah i can't think of the exact quote because i don't have it in front of me of course but it's uh you know basically just saying like you're gonna get a headache because it's a very a uh, scorpionic or martial plant and and you know that's very true one time i was like why did i have such a headache and i was like oh i was working with basil oil and uh it was it was a bit too much as an incense but like of course it's going to be different if you make it in a pesto or if you have a little bit in a perfume or etc so yeah it, it depends on the application sometimes it depends on the part of the plant too that's like a big a big one um because we can look at nettle and say like I, this is also a great example. I learned that like nettle root can help soothe the um, the stings that are caused by the uritic acid in nettle's hair. So, you know, sometimes you get everything you need all in the same plant. And, you know, is the root less martial than the the, the hairs or the, the leaves of nettle? Um, are the seeds more martial or less? Because they're actually a great adrenal tonic and it's great for elders who may have less Mars energy in their life as they age, you know, because Mars, I feel like factors in a lot heavily, uh, more heavily for younger people. So all these things, right? Like these are all factors and we have to look at like a complete picture. But uh, are yeah, that being are you said, saying we have to look at this with nuance and, and subtlety. Is that what you're never? Doing? No, oh, take okay. the hammer. We okay. always use the hammer, not yeah. the scalpel. Um, <laughs> See the same the same <laughs> crowd on Twitter who would give you shit about using the R word. They're the people who <laughs> it's just it's one it's one way. It's just like there's only that one way to do things, and not realizing that. I mean, the the pros or the people who really know or. It's it's completely going to be based on the particulars of the situation, and it's just it's beautiful to hear, even just in the past ten minutes, how much of that you've shared. And um, I also didn't know that you tailored um, certain things to the natal chart in that way. That's that's really really cool. Yeah, I want my um like my astrological products. I don't want to plug too much, but it, um, the perfumes and stuff, especially the Zodiac line was something that was like very special for me that came out of like um, actually being copied by someone, but they just slapped some different names on it. And I got so incensed, right? Of someone that I knew and uh, if someone I hadn't spoken to in years, and then I found their, uh, their products and I was like, what? <laughs> Cause we all, everybody can make Zodiac things we can all make astrological things right like there's some things you know where your own uh sort of personal relationships with with the material at hand and then you can tell when someone else read the same book as you etc i really just try to do things based on experience although like that wasn't always true right we can't always come from a place of experience at the very beginning <laughs> but yeah i started to realize um that I had more I was I got a little mad at first and I was like why are you getting mad just make your own like that's what you do you make things and you know make things the way that you would have made it make it uh to really do justice to each zodiac sign you know so that was a bit of a a little learning curve for me but uh I don't remember what we had originally <laughs> how we got on this oh no, yeah no. Me, not, me not wanting to plug it but yeah I want those to be uh although I do I make them during like new or full moons that are uh entirely like uh sort of adjacent to like the material that's being made like uh you know making a cancer oil every cancer new moon or cancer full moon uh because I feel like that tends to be some of the strongest but the safest uh, application i'm i'm definitely not someone who's making like if i make a, a really specific let's say like when i made the exalted sun incense uh, and i found the proper election for it it that's going to happen once in a while just limited edition you know and mostly because i want people who don't work with magic to be able to experience it too or if it's a little scary for them um, you know, I want them to be able to have fun and just use something that smells nice, right? I have a lot of friends and family that don't really uh 
you know, know what I'm talking about half the time and that's okay. Uh, they just, you know, they like the way things smell and that's okay too. And these plants also, or these scents will also just do the thing you need them to do, even without knowing how Zodiac correlated they are, right? Like you want to relax or you want something that's going to be more invigorating. Well, that's going to do it regardless of your background in astrology. So yeah, I just, uh, it, it can work for what you want it to, but it's more like a charged item for your own personal practice rather than something that's going to necessarily make, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess just synchronicities, like those little synchronicities we have when we start working with a plant or planet, et cetera. Uh, it can definitely aid in that, but it's not going to make it happen the way that like really specifically aligned materia would you know like i have some amazing sphere and sundry stories which i would be more than happy to share because that sort of magic is very very much aligned with like it's that magic is following you around when you're walking down the street so yeah no doubt. yeah um you mentioned your unique voice and i can't help but come back to the fact that the moon is moving to conjoin Algol right now, as well as the episode being just ever so slightly linked to the star of Endymiatrix in Virgo, which is, um, for those who don't know, the hand that holds, um, for me at least, the the poisonous plant uh, in contrast to Spica, or the hand which holds the, um, you know, the the shaft of wheat or this sort of thing. And there is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, similar to Vanessa, sort of like a malefic flavor to Black Earth. And you call it goth, call it malefic. Um, but I, I, I think that that comes through really strongly um, at, at every level. And it's not just like a superficial aesthetic like it, it is for many, frankly. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to that part of your practice, which I hope maybe gets us into talking a little bit about your experience with poisonous plants, especially in your work, and if you can with astrology. But um, yeah, where is the 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 goth poisonous plant element coming in for you? Um, well, so I think I'll take it from the top of your question, or maybe it wasn't the question, but it was that the um, the moon is moving into conjunction with algal. And um, I'm an Algolian, which for, I I think, uh, a Meyer work coined that, coined that term. At least that was one of the first um, times I heard it, yeah. <laughs> either from, from them or Sasha, um, where it's like when you have a planet in conjunction with Algol, and it really does steer a lot of your life. I mean, it is, it's one of the more difficult fixed stars, if not the most <laughs> difficult, uh, or at least that's how it feels at times, you know, um, but this type of energy is also really transformative and i found that she really likes creation i say she because it's you know the severed head of medusa mother algal however we really want to see her in our in our mind's eye um but it is this really primal creative force and i found that like sort of creating things in her name more or less or trying to appease that energy by uh just creating in some way especially when it's really visceral um, that can be really helpful. And uh, again, I don't know if this would even be considered remediation, but it is something that you really need to do with a lot of discipline or else all of a sudden it kind of comes back around when you least suspect it. But at least it's a, a sort of soothing that energy. Uh, so yeah, I definitely, I relate to Algol a lot. I relate to a lot of the the sentiment behind, you know, a lot of the tales involving her um involving medusa uh what i did see because i don't work with uh vindimiatrix in my like i don't really have anything close to it in my own chart i feel like that's how most people end up getting into fixed stars is like oh there's something that's a really glaring obvious <laughs> force in my life let me take a look at you know where it might be in my chart um so yeah i haven't Really, but when I was researching it a little bit more um, to really find some connections, I did see that it's also like at least in older astrology, it was thought of to be as as potent or like sort of around as difficult as algal. 
um yeah, to work exactly. with. Well, so the widow, yeah, I and, call it the widow maker. Yeah. For similar reasons. And there's like a also the same, you know, like algal is linked to beheadings and uh neck breakings. Uh there's a lot of stories about like uh like Isidore Duncan, I believe, had algal conjunct something. I see when I don't have it in front of me, I should have been more prepared. But uh, you know, she was had her neck broken almost completely by like a scarf that was caught in the wheel of her car uh, that she was wearing. I remember hearing this story as like a kid too. And I, I re felt really oddly connected to it. It was like something that stood out over the years. So yeah, sometimes that, that energy comes into your life. You don't know why you got to end up researching it, etc. But so in the, in the tale, in the mythology of uh, how this star came to be, or at least like, maybe no no i think it was the star right it's um that uh bacchus granted and i can't think of the name now i have this i had it written down so i could um but yeah like uh bacchus is definitely there. <laughs> yeah yeah but now yeah. i'm sorry i'm like having a hard time even ampelos there we go i was trying to find it this is what happens when you make notes and you don't read them um like while picking grapes fell and broke their neck which obviously was such a connection to that type of algal energy and so yeah then ended up among the stars sort of you know as a sign of respect because they loved their picking grapes and you know back and back us and wine and grapes uh so this is like what translates also to like the the grape gatherer is that the term yeah. i yeah yeah so if we're looking into like the astrology of this uh the plants involved like it's interesting because obviously we think of grapes uh for jupiter for the most part because it's a fruit and there's that alignment um in perfumery we would use green cognac uh that's it doesn't really smell as much like cognac as it does kind of like grapes it's a little hard to describe um but there's even a little bit of rot to it you know, like it can smell nice. a little bit like, yeah, like a cognac barrel, you know, that little bit of oakiness or something. Um, and it usually is kind of like a clearish green fluid. So it's not like a dark Hennessy color uh, or something that we would really associate with that. Like it still does have a grapey element, but without being too um, overtly sweet, but it's still fruity. So sometimes you would use it to give like a roundness or a juiciness to uh, certain perfumes but it's it's never really used like full-on because to me I think it does have like a strangeness that's hard to balance out so yeah perfumery speaking wise <laughs> that's a sentence that <laughs> perfumery speaking wise um but yeah I don't know speaking fragrantly on the topic uh, Ooh, that's how yeah. I would uh -huh. you know kind of uh associate that but uh yeah we don't really we don't really this this is also when that sort of like a uh, sympathetic way of thinking comes in where we're like okay well grapes and wine obviously and wine is poison it's poisonous alcohol um therein is also like the connection with algal because um it's thought of that the the word algul is the root for both algal and alcohol and uh she definitely does like alcohol um but that's a whole other topic uh, i wonder if vindimiatrix also likes that probably likes being venerated with wine to some degree um but something interesting too is that uh it's sort of thought of as like like in perfume you have solifleurs which are plants usually flowers right solifleur single flower um that are complex enough to kind of make a perfume of all of on its own and make that the main star uh and sometimes that means just like yeah single note it's just that one perfume right it's that one scent of gardenia let's say um but yeah so that's kind of what's going on with like when we're wine tasting and we're trying to get all of the notes that are so complex out of you know different types of wine so it's it's a similar idea there's a lot of crossover between perfumery and uh wine making or wine tasting and so there's a lot of interest there and i really enjoy it um there's also a lot obviously this is why we do like wine tastings uh sometimes you want to pair it with some food and then all of a sudden there's like this uh uh 
secret third thing that happens in your mouth. <laughs> like, wow, I didn't know that like this eked out the flavors in that way. Um, and so it's like a synchronicity sort of, and that happens in perfumery too. That's why we have certain accords that are more traditional than others, right? Like um, one big one is the chifra. Uh, I actually will get into this a little bit later, but I'm teaching a class on magical accords at Ritual Craft in Denver on um, July 14th. It's a Sunday. So I will give all that information later uh, at the end of the episode. <laughs> but yeah, that'll be dope. Yeah, one of the things uh, I was talking about is that sort of like uh, effect when a few plant materials come together and they sort of make something completely like unlike, you know, anything else that could be done on its own. Right. So if you have a chifra, it's usually a combination. And and this means Cyprus in French. Right. Because it, it's thought to all the ingredients came from the Isle of Cyprus. But I also believe that this is the birthplace of perfumery, of modern perfumery, at least. Yeah. So that's like a whole other. See, this is we can go down avenues and avenues. Oh, so of many Cyprus, rabbit holes. But, yeah, <laughs> I know. But yeah, so um, it. It's usually labdanum, uh, oak moss, and some sort of citrus top note, usually bergamot. Um, and so these are kind of make this this effect that I consider it like a very Jovian um, combination of things because then you're, it's anytime you have that synchronicitous effect um, that's making a whole new third thing, it's kind of very lucky. And it's, it is the epitome of expansion and cooperation. So, yeah, usually I use that sort of thing uh, magically when it when you find it in perfumery, especially when using that as a base for other plants. Um, so yeah, that being said, uh, these are all things that like I've really geeked out over when I'm not a big wine person. I wish I was. I lived in California for nine years. You would think I knew more about wine and wine tasting, but um, but yeah, I have had those really cool experiences where you're like oh my god this is like you know this this uh religious experience that i understand why people build their lives around wine now right and so much goes into that too like the terroir uh is built from like the the type of soil the, the way that the grapes are treated um grapes in different countries make better uh wine for certain you know certain orange wines are better in like Slovenia or like Georgia. I really tend to love these wines the most because they're the most different. Yeah. So again, we could go down a total rabbit hole in relation to these, but poisonous plants. Yeah. Wine is still technically poisonous. So that's also a great place to start. <laughs> um, I do think poison is relative, right? Uh, and so that is how I work with poisonous plants almost everything is relatively poison. Um, I don't really have much of a, although I, I used to work with it more on my own, uh, in my own daily practice or my own life, uh, the spirits of poisonous plants more than, than I would uh, really taking them and ingesting them like a lot of people do, or even using as a self, like very, very rarely I've connected with them because sometimes it's, it's really just any other plant that you could look at, like the tree outside my window, uh, rhododendron, azalea. <laughs> um, there's a, a certain degree of toxicity to everything. And I think that like the ones that for a while, the, the witch community has become more aligned with, like the what, what we would call the poison path, right? Um, that is super subjective and relative right like we are also using these plants largely from one tradition which is like european um and even western european to some degree and uh kind of exalting them over other plants and their like locality i think matters and you know like i said whichever plants are kind of speaking to us a little more um and again there's a certain degree of toxicity to everything it's just a matter of dose so that is sort of my view on on poison plants but i do work with some more than others and I, i've grown some more than others and i have a deep reverence which is why i don't uh don't tend to like experiment in the way of like in 
entheogenic way, if I'm pronouncing that right, because I, I don't ever have an opportunity to I usually <laughs> see it's just written or I write it. I think that's the um, right pronunciation. Yeah. I, yeah. So I, that being I, said. I love that. Um, I was, I'm just kind of like silently laughing to myself um, like an idiot because I mean, yeah, I am. <laughs> you were the right person to have on this episode because I mean, frankly, so much of that is um, maybe trendy is too strong of a word, but yeah, I mean, there's been for the past 10 or 15 years, a sort of like um, romantic romanticization, um, glamorizing of that a certain subset of plants. You said most of them more European um, and the poison path, which I mean, if we're being honest these days, like most most witches are adding like gluten to the poison path and they're like all, all these different kinds of things. It's like uh, the relativity of that is important. And if we're going to get past the whole like, yeah, the glamour and the the that sexy danger to all of that stuff, then, yeah, I mean, really, most things are are, are pretty damn toxic. Um, and I love what you said about just like looking out your window and thinking about ingesting any of that. Um, it's that's such a once again, like bring, bringing it back to um, the base reality point with it. It's such a Saturn moon point, And it's important. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I greatly appreciate it. I, I think to kind of also piggybacking off of something that you said with um Vendemiatrix in particular, I so there is something about wine drinking, and I would also include tobacco usage in these like accessible poisons or poisons which have been normalized to the point that we don't even really think about it, which at some level, they're even more dangerous. And um, maybe you could include other kinds of alcohol uh, alongside the the retinue of Vendemiatrix. It doesn't have to be just wine per se, but other like dangerous fermented things we could say, um, or, you know, hard, harder alcohols or ones that um, intoxicate you more quickly. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's something to that as well versus like, w like many people know you go camping, you avoid poison oak and ivy, this kind of thing, like the poison or, you know, that the Jimson weed is gonna, is gonna have you trip balls or you're gonna die from it. But um, something with like, yeah, alcohol or tobacco, I would include as well as like, this this hand of uh, the hand of Virgo, yes. the hand of Vendemiatrix sticking out, being like, oh well, this is this this is not poison, or you know, being the hand that hands you the cup, and it coming from you know someone who you consider to be a, a friend or a confidant, like, oh, this isn't poison, this is just um, to help you socialize, or you know, these these kinds of things are perhaps even more pernicious in the end. Um, I don't know any any thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. That's um very much how I feel. Just in, in regards of dealing with um almost every plant is like there are those connections that can be you know, I don't want to say the word like malefic <laughs> just because we're talking about malefics, but yeah, basically there's there's a certain degree of um malice to that sort of connection with like wine for one great example that you're using, you know, it really is all in how you're, how you're using it because it can be medicine and it can be like form the base for medicine. Um, and it can completely be poison. It depends on what spirits you're feeding too. Um, so yeah, with that, um, with that being said, if I'm understanding the question correctly, because sometimes I have lots of thoughts and I do tend to jump around um when we're talking about like tobacco that is that's also something that like it, it does have such a heavy saturn congruence from most people that write about it and i actually find that it has a bit of like more of a sagittarian uh lean so it's not it's not jovian like it's not a jovian plant per se but uh it's a spirit gate opener like it's if we're just looking at it as like purely poison then we're missing all of the the history of tobacco and how it actually has been used outside of like um current societies like dopamine 
fix. Like now we're basically just distilling uh, nicotine to put into vapes. So uh, there's that meme of of dinosaurs fueling uh, fossil fuel that somehow creates. Oh no, no, it was dinosaurs. It was dinosaurs becoming chickens, like evolving into being chickens, and then the chickens are made into dinosaur shaped chicken nuggets. I'm vegan, by the way. <laughs> but uh can't condone this can't condone the chicken nuggies but uh yeah it's it's that meme that's like and yet a, a hint of the true self exists in the fall self or something like that so that's kind of like the way that we're using plants and using even right to begin with we're using them even agriculturally uh can be the poison it doesn't even have to be the plant itself right like if we're looking at all plants with respect mutually and anything that we're gleaning from this earth which also you know gets back into virgo a little bit too uh and we'll get into that in just a minute too because i did want to mention that in estrella and uh the virgo constellation to begin with but yeah it's when we're losing touch with what the earth has given us or like the the magic that these plants have and how they can benefit our lives and we are just sort of smoking we're, we're losing touch with spirit and like the creator in general or even if you're working with just multiple gods and that's your tradition i think you can say the same is that there's some source that we're all sort of losing touch with so like yeah we can look at as you know tobacco as just a saturnian poisonous plant uh that you know, it's it's so edgy to smoke a little bit, but really it's you're opening up these these spirit gates. And a big part of that is also like these uh, receptors in your brain that are allowing us to open ourselves to be more receptive to uh, ancestors and ghosts and other spirits and things we're letting in. So, yeah, that's poison. If you eat it, you might die or get really sick, but also like you could be poisoning yourself by allowing the wrong spirits to attach to you because uh every time you i don't know god i sound like an anti-smoking ad but like um the more you smoke right the more this is something that i've heard uh from taking some pretty amazing classes about uh plants for addiction and etc so uh, you know don't come at me with the complete science on this but uh to my knowledge when you are smoking it's generally accepted uh, belief that you are creating more receptors for nicotine in your brain and that it's like one of the most dopaminergic plants or you know drugs if we're going to use the word drug uh, it's one of the most dopaminergic drugs that we can access in society and so that's why it's so hard to quit smoking um, more than other other things you could be quitting right uh, its effect can be a little subtle obviously like you don't always feel it you'll feel it when you don't have it and that's why you need more and more of it so yeah that is that's also a form of poison and it's poisoning your your life and your well-being to a degree but also you know using something like that in ceremony and responsibly is completely different and you know we've just we have lost touch with a lot of ways of seeing and being like I can talk shit because I can go to the store and buy a cucumber rather than grow it. Of course, like we are very limited in what we can do. But um, one reason that I don't really work with poison plants in the way that um, a lot of others do, like poison path style, although there was a time in my life that that was more uh, relevant when I was able to work with them, uh, you know, growing them myself and having a garden. That was a big one. Um, and being able to learn about them more that way. Uh, I really think that like people just don't use plants responsibly in society or like they don't respect them uh, responsibly as our guides or elders or, or anything. And so of course it's going to be the ones that are the most baneful and the most powerful that might resonate more because nothing else is getting through. Like we are, we are numb to, <laughs> to the, the plants around us for the most part, you know, because like, you can you can also just go into a store and buy flowers and again i'm not saying that this is a bad thing we can go into store and buy flowers we have access to so many things just not like uh in the way that we we should be sort of accessing them like everything has gotten a little too easily basically you know we have that convenience so until society completely 
you know, changes or until people change uh, their, their, their path a little bit, um, it might only be these plants that are like a hammer rather than a scalpel trying to get through because that's the only thing that can really get through, you know? Um, so I think if, if you're having these certain plants come through for you in life, uh, sometimes it means like this is your gateway, your spirit gateway. Like the Torah is such a big one because it can break you out of one part of life into the next phase. And we see this a little bit too when using it. And I've, I've had major synchronicities when like using flower essences uh, or like all of a sudden I'm using Brugmansia for someone and someone else is using uh, Datura, you know? And so both of these things are, they're cousins. They're not the same plant, but you know, it's just something where like these two spirits came to two different people for the same person saying, all right, this is to guide them onto their next life stage, right? They're having a hard time transitioning. So it's a big one. It can be really gentle, but really powerful if you work with it in a certain way, it doesn't always have to be scary. Like again, flower essences are a great way to work with that. Um, and then there's other ways that are like, they're going to be more powerful because you feel like you need that to get through to you. You're not sensitive enough. You've been desensitized to everything around you. And maybe that that's going to be the most uh, effective way is by, by, you know, working a little more dangerously with, with the plant. But I also, I've, I've seen people abuse this sort of thing and I've kind of, um, I'm not super judgy and I can be a hater, but I'm not like the kind of hater that would kind of act like I'm better than anyone else. <laughs> like I'm certainly not, I've certainly abused, you know, certain things in my life that, uh, have taught me lessons. Right. We all have, but, um, yeah, well, I would I'd... say like, I, I I just want to say that you you will go down um, for making the <laughs> the unstoppable connection between the malefics and chicken nuggies. Um, <laughs> <they'll>, <laughs> of course, that's why that's the only reason I had to say I'm vegan because I know that. <laughs> this will be legendary. I know somehow that will be on my name forever. <laughs> um, but I think with yeah. like even even with that, I I think it it brings up a good point, which is this kind of, and I, you know, the word I'll use, which I'm sure people would use it, would use a different word or just think of this word differently. Uh, the word I will use is sorcery um, in the sense that, you know, vendemiatrix and, and this um, impulse to transform has the potential to become, you know, a, a weapon, um, a, a, a potent poison or, you know, what, what I would call sorcery. It's just that it's, it's more about the, the, the changing of it into whatever form one wants to change it into, as opposed to just, you know, reckoning with or being with that plant just at its, I guess at its more fundamental levels. And I think for me, like, um, Algol for me, oftentimes, um, I think about her in relation to the transformation of um, things like uranium and these stone, these these store these stones and uh, minerals in the depths of the earth that we've turned into like the most powerful w weapons that have ever existed, capable of destroying entire planets. Um, to me, Vendemiatrix is like the plant version of that, meaning that it can allow you, you know, a, a, an immense level of depth in terms of understanding of, of that world, the botanical world, let's say. Um, and, and I'll go all the same for just the world in general, like a, an, a, an extreme depth of knowledge. But there's also, you know, a huge responsibility that comes with being able to enact that kind of sorcery to turn, you know, uh, dinosaurs into fuel the oil which then fuels the creation of little chicken nuggy dinosaur shaped <laughs> yeah, this I think kind I of have, thing you have, know <laughs> yeah i might have uh, mixed two memes up there but whatever no, um, now no i think done. it's good now alcohol now it's alcohol good is we're related to chicken nuggies it's um, good but i mean yeah just that kind of like take taking poison beyond uh, as you've been doing um over the course of this show, taking poison beyond just a really superficial idea of like, oh, well, that plant is poisonous or like the poison path or whatever. 
into just I, I think what I'm what I'm calling the the potential for sorcery, which is you know, just unlimited transformation without any sort of um, you know boundary for health or ethics or anything like that. Um, not to shit on the word sorcery either, but uh, I I think to me that that's sort of the underlying connection with something like Algol and and Vendimiatrix, perhaps. Um, Anyways, yeah, yeah. Well, something, um, well, something I had thought about earlier in relation to like Virgo and the constellation of Virgo, right, is because like we we tend to look at uh, Astrea, right, as being like the the virgin who we associate with the Virgo constellation, um, who had was immortal but then left Earth because it, you know, was after the Golden Age, I believe, right? It was like during the bronze age and sometimes it's like the iron age i don't really remember like what the the accepted age was but um you know it was like when people started to fight each other and become kind of covetous they lost their trust in each other um she didn't want to mingle among the citizens anymore and it was then they started to eat the oxen that were meant for plowing right and so this is kind of like a big theme in a lot of like biblical stories as well and like you know, when people start to turn on each other and it becomes sort of more like a uh, sort of, I don't want to say like what we have going on now as a society, right? Because everything is so nuanced. But um, yeah, it's, I, I kind of really take that as the way that we're treating things that we, we look at as our resources meant for us and rather not for the earth. And so this is like deeply in relation to like how we treat each other as well and you know virgo being like the great alchemizer where i look at a lot of um because this was something that we had we had brought up at some point too is that like uh virgo's relation to medicinal and healing plants and everything uh jupiter is in its uh detriment here but it's also like looked at as one of the more healthier signs so it's associated with with uh physical uh elimination from the body and like health and rejuvenation and all, all these other things right it's kind of almost like an anomaly among the mutable signs for anyone who wants to figure out virgo it seems like a bit of a like you know you have you have wild sag and then like airy communicative gemini and like you know pisces for Christ's sakes, we already talked about Pisces. But then Virgo seems kind of like the odd one out because we don't really know how to understand it. But there's this mutability. It's it's also like as the plants alchemize uh, minerals and metals and such for the soil as part of this whole process, and then we are gracious enough to be able to receive that from them, but we we need these things, right? It's not something we can live without, like these, these trace minerals in any way. Um, it, that's what it's doing for us and so virgo also is kind of like the the alchemizer in our own bodies uh the the systems that are ruled by this are you know like at least our look at our large intestines and how that's like the last as (laughs) now we're talking about poop okay (laughs) yeah it's sort of like our last (laughs) we've reached that point in the podcast i'm so excited (laughs) um you know we we have to assimilate all of these things into our own body and it's it's that within us which is deciding what stays and what goes you know we're solving the fix we're coagulating the volatile um what is necessary for survival and what is waste you know and so this is like a very important mutable uh trait that we kind of end up overlooking sometimes uh when we look at like our bodily processes and how these are all interconnected to um yeah, then we start to get a better idea of how this astrology truly works because we are the, we're a microcosm, you know, like we are still a part of a microcosm and we forget that that's within our own bodies as well. So yeah, these are great. These are kind of great examples for, you know, not necessarily talking about poison, but eliminating the things that we don't need that is that is waste as opposed to like what it comes in so when we're looking at like the sheath of wheat spica which is nourishment uh i don't know if you had already mentioned this on the podcast or when we were just sort of riffing but that people are including gluten uh as a part of 
like the poison path, which is, I think it's really interesting. You know, I love to hear more about people's. I, oh, I said, I said that as a joke, but. Oh, but... did you? That's funny because <laughs> here it is. Uh, you I've see, been you, thinking you about see it. it? Whole time. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, well, I, since I had a donut right before, maybe that was my flower essence of wheat and my. <laughs> my, oh my my God. microdose of we my speaker um but yeah so we have what nourishes us on one hand um and then maybe it's the waste in the other hand or like that which we are eliminating that is unnecessary and there's no greater purgative sometimes than like that which is considered you know poisonous uh one really interesting trait of many like i'm not going to say ingest any of these plants my god do not listen to this but um, plants that are mildly poisonous uh, is that sometimes it's it's like a belly ache. You get a little bit of a belly ache, and then you get the runs, and it's your your body trying to eliminate what it took in, right? So you're not getting like these uh, psychedelic effects as some of the more well known like poison path plants that people you know quite frankly abuse for recreational purposes. But um, you know sometimes if you just have a little bit too much of a plant that might otherwise be edible. Um, even just like now food that our body thinks is an allergen, uh, like look at how many people have a nightshade allergy also. This is a great, great example, um, you know, because of these uh, chemicals or otherwise like these um, alkaloids that tend to get found in these plants that our body is reacting to in a certain way and it usually reacts by elimination. So that's in and of itself like when i was really exploring this that was one of the one of the basic ideas that i had kind of been throwing around in my head is just basically like the the uh difference between nourishment and ingestion on one hand literally and then on the other elimination so I uh that. i yeah, one, one of the things I, I talk about a lot um i did a i did a virgo moon episode for um, um, luminaries in and out of sect podcast because I have a Virgo moon, and um, what, one of the things I'm that I talked about on that episode and that I'm fond of talking about in general is that um, for the Aztec, for the Mexica people, the corn deity Senteot was um, thought to be born from the the filth mother herself, Tlazolteot, who. It's it's even it's sort of it's similar, but also the reverse of what you were saying in that, like the nourishment is actually born directly from the filth. Um, she is the, you know, the eater of all filth and the eater of all sin and um, corn, you know, which is essentially, you know, it's it's South America's rice or it's wheat. It, it it's um, the same as saying life just like bread and life are the same and, you know, in so many languages, um, that this is thought to emerge, the thing which nourishes, uh, people more than anything else thought to emerge directly from, you know, the, the anus of the world. I, I find fascinating just in that reversal of things like, no, it's, it's not something we, we keep away. Like we know this is where it comes from. Yeah. yeah I'm gonna, I, I was about to, to bridge into, concluding remarks but i did want to ask you if there were things that you felt like we didn't get to talk about we didn't get to cover um some you know burning questions anything like that that you wanted to talk about before we um sort of wrap things up what do you think um well unfortunately my my comments on any topic are limitless because i have mars conjunct mercury so uh, I want to thank everyone for listening. Yeah, I can I can go on for long periods of time about almost anything that interests me. So <laughs> that is my final, that is my closing. Um, but I did want to say also, uh, if you go to school.ritualcraft.com, I believe, that is where you'd be able to find more information on the class I'm doing uh, that I briefly touched upon, the Magical Accords, uh, or... Uh, blending from accords is maybe the name of the class, but it's a uh, or magical perfumery blending from accords. That's the actual term if you're searching for it. On July 14th, I think it's one to three p.m. at Ritual Craft, and I'm very excited to be going there. 
So yeah, that's it. That's and great. Did you want me to? You did, did the, you the me yeah. No, do, do you can do your, you can do your plugs. Yeah, I'll I'll put okay. You know, right. wet website, Patreon, <laughs> uh, the shop, all in the show notes. But yeah, do your plugs. Other oh, things you have coming up. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's it. That's basically as much as I have coming up. Uh. But I've been uh I've been working on these astrological sort of newsletters uh that kind of bridge like just for anyone who's a little interested in astrology but uh so maybe this isn't the right audience but uh people who might want to find mm. certain materia based on certain plants or certain uh seasons etc i'm i'm put, just putting together these newsletters which you could you know find through the link in my bio on instagram uh, black earth botanica uh and on my website blackearth.nyc and it forwards to like big cartel you could sign up for the list there but so I've been working on that and uh and Patreon of course Black Earth on Patreon uh just trying to add a little bit more writing into my into my uh practice right now because that's sort of escaped me for a long time and I just want to keep things like accessible for people too uh you know so you always have the option to like sign up as just a five dollar Patreon or you can get the free once a month newsletter uh that kind of markets some of the products but like not always now i'm just trying to yeah make it a little bit more fun everybody go check out the patreon <laughs> check out the website check out the store check out the upcoming class um thank you so much janine for thank you so much for having show. me it's been such a pleasure anytime thank you for thinking of me honestly especially with uh with the star that i didn't realize you know, resonated as much as it did with Algol, who's so dear to my heart. So I, I like that we could just do all that live, you know, that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. You were the perfect person to have on for this. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I hope I can come by again in the future sometime. And I look Absolutely. forward to hearing this episode. Absolutely. Okay. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.